Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Masters in Business with Barry Ritholtz on Bloomberg Radio. This week on the podcast, finally, I get Colin Camera in the studio to talk about neuroeconomics, behavioral finance, and really all the fascinating things he's been doing at Caltech for the past, geez, been there for almost uh, 30 years. Is that about right? He's really an interesting guy, not just because he has the mathematical and behavioral finance background, but because he essentially asked the question, what's going on inside our brains when we make decisions? What's happening before we even have a degree of awareness of our own decisions. Um, I, I just find what he does fascinating, not just fMRIs, but eye tracking and EG and um, galvanomic responses of the skin and just on and on, all these different ways to measure um, what's going on with your hormones, what's going on pharmacologically it, within your body. Um, it, it's both fascinating and terrifying because you, you come to realize what you think is a decision you're making very often is a decision your brain is making with or without you. Uh, I found our conversation to be absolutely fascinating. And I think you will also, with no further ado, my sit down with Caltech's Colin Kammerer. Thanks for having me. So I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you for a long time, not just because of my interest in behavioral finance, but because of the space you occupy in neuroeconomics, we'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But let's start with your background, which is kind of astonishing. You get a bachelor's in quantitative studies from John Hopkins at 17, and then an MBA in finance and a PhD in decision theory from the University of Chicago at 21. That's a lot of school really quickly. What were the career plans? Were you thinking academia? Or were you thinking finance? Um, I was actually kind of not quite sure. So I got in. I went to Chicago grad school for PhD um, in the Booth now Booth School of Business because I had learned a little bit about finance. I took an independent study from Carl Christ, who's a famous econometrician mm-hmm. at Johns Hopkins, um, when Gene Fama's book uh, Foundations of Finance had just come out. In fact, I, I literally worked in the college bookstore part-time, and I remember unpacking the box that it had this Fama book. And so I immediately bought one, and you know I was going to do this independent study and read through. And by the way, it really is... Some books are often called Foundations of Blank. It really was Foundations of Blank. Right. You know, it, it, was the, it was the summary in the 1976, right? Very early days. Um, and so Carl Christ had said, well, you should think about Chicago. That's a powerhouse place for finance. And... Um, so I started studying finance there and passed the prelim, which is no, which is no small feat. It's very selective. And then um, um, I got interested in behavioral science because finance was really obsessed with market efficiency, and you know there was no behavioral science, uh, behavioral finance in sight at that time. But there were other folks at at Chicago. Well. Uh, if I recall correctly, Dick Thaler was there early in the behavioral finance, uh, um, or, or, or did he end he, up there later? Yeah, he came later. He mm-hmm. came later. So when I came in the late 70s, um, uh, a lot of Nobel Prize winners were there, Fama, Miller, Scholes. I think Fisher Black might have just left for MIT at, at when I came, um, but it was pre- Andre Schleifer and uh, Rob Vishny, who did a lot of interesting behavioral finance, and then Dick Thaler came, I think, around 1995, 1996. Mm -hmm. Um, And you were at Caltech by then, right? Correct. So, yeah, so Dick and I had just passed like ships in the night, and um, I regret that sometimes, not having just stayed and, you know, been part of a new vanguard. Um, Well, but you are, you actually are part of a new vanguard because the work you do in neuroeconomics, which we're going to get into, especially uh, fMRIs and all the other things you've done, more or less created that space. I mean, that's pretty foundational. Behavioral finance has a number of fathers, including um, Dick Thaler and and Danny Kahneman. Um, So, well, let's circle back to, to the neuroeconomics in a little bit. But I want to ask what led you into decision-making research. How did you find yourself taking the background you had 
um, in in quantitative studies and um, your PhD and MBA and, and go into decision making? Um, so I, some of it was when I was in college at Johns Hopkins, I, I studied physics and math. That was uh-huh. too abstract. Uh, and number theory was just too mind blowing, you know, for me. Like I'm just not going to work at that level. And then I studied psychology, and that seemed like just kind of a list of things that happened to people, but there was no unifying squishy, principles. Right? Yeah, squishy. And then economics, um, which I really only took a little bit of, a lot fewer than my peers. I later competed with in grad school, was kind of in between, like the three little bears. You know, it was there was I love that, and there was people. <laughs> right. You know, physics didn't have people. Psychology didn't have math. Economics they, was kind of the right mix. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. Um, and I think a lot of a, a lot of social scientists may uh, feel that way. And the people who li- like math less stay in psychology or go to sociology or something where the the mathematical structure isn't really fa- the the canon and the foundation. Um, so what led you into game theory? You end up writing a book, Behavioral Game Theory, that was published in '03. Uh, how does that relate to economics and decision making and investing? Um, so when, in graduate school, when I pivoted away from finance, there was a couple of um, psychologists, Hilly Einhorn and um, Robin Hogarth, who were interested in judgment decision making. They were d- doing things very similar to Kahneman and Diversky. Mm-hmm. It was sort of somewhat mathematical attempts to understand actual human decision making, not really stylized like Bayes' rule and optimization. You know, those are good things to know, but they were interested in deviations from those and and what that might tell us and what the practical value is. So that's what I ended up doing in grad school. Game theory came a little bit later because um, at Chicago at that time, in the late 70s, there was hardly any interest in game theory for peculiar reasons. They were you know, the economic world was dominated by price theory, supply mm-hmm. and demand, like Gary Becker. You know, there was a lot going on. Game theory just was not flourishing there. But my first job was as an assistant professor at Northwestern. And that happened to be, through just historical coincidence, a hotbed of great game theory. Paul Milgram was there. Bengt Holmstrom was there. Robert Weber, who worked on um, uh, uh, lots of things on auction theory, uh, Dave Barron, who was interested in political economy and ga- you know political systems as games. So Milgram and Holstrom went on to win Nobel Prizes and went to other places. So it was sort of this incubator place that then you know like a incubator like um, uh, Hewlett Packard and things like uh-huh. that, where people then went off to do other stuff. Uh, and so I basically learned game theory in my in my first job as assistant professor, um, and and that uh, game theory is similar to behavioral economics. The the standard theory that everyone teaches in every introductory course is people are rational and um, make the best choices given what they think others will do, and they're correct guessing about what others do. Like a bunch of people who played poker with each other, you know, every Friday night for decades, right. they kind of know what the tells are and. But I, we we were interested in what happens before you get to this kind of what's called Nash equilibrium, you know, where everyone mm-hmm. has guessed correctly what everyone's going to do. Um, and so to me, there was a huge room for for understanding the psychology of strategic thinking uh, in game theory. So so that's goal. really interesting. Uh, to me, I always found the traditional economic homo economists of humans as rational, calculating, profit maximizing actors is just complete contradiction of real life experience. How did you go from your initial interest in behavioral finance into neuroeconomics where you're looking at the biological underpinnings of what happens as people make decisions? Yeah, so the neuroeconomics to me was sort of a natural extension of behavioral economics, which was we're going to grab for any interesting data and different ways of thinking about humans outside of standard economics and kind of pull it in and try to, you know, generate a kind of hybrid. It was almost like an import-export business. Like I'm going to import some psychology or Dick Thaler imported from Kahneman. And what is this going to tell us about fairness and reference points and loss aversion and what have you? And neuroeconomics seemed to me like just another thing to do. Part of it is my personality is kind of like intellectual entrepreneurship. So I liked, you know, doing different things. You know, over the years, I've worked on lots of different methods and with different groups of people. And neuroeconomics was just a chance to do something even more um, dramatic. And and tell us about your patent on active learning decision engines. <laughs> what on earth is that? So active learning is the computer scientist term. It's sometimes called dynamic adaptive learning. For basically, like if I was going to try to figure out um, 
how much you like risk, like you're a client and, uh -huh. and an, a financial advisor is asking. You know, I might start by saying, well, here's a portfolio. Is this too risky or not risky enough? And if you say, nah, that's not risky enough, I, you know, I'd rather go for more. And then I would, I would give you a better one that's a little has a little more risk in it. And it, in chemistry, it's called titration. You know, you kind of change the mixture of the chemicals. And so for each person, you're asking them a dynamic, customized set of questions to get to the best answer as quickly as possible. And that's called active learning. Mm -hmm. So one of my colleagues at Caltech at that time, Andreas Kraus, was studying, he was a computer scientist. So they're always on the frontier of how to get the truth faster and subject to computational constraints. Like, mm -hmm. you know, because sometimes it's not just a question of getting there, but can you do it in real time so you don't have to wait half an hour, you know, to ask the, ask the next highly informative question. Um, and so the patent was just a, a method that Andreas and another guy who now works at Google, I believe, Daniel Golovin and me had worked on to apply this in a, in a in a particular way, and so it was basically a software patent. There was an it was a patent on an algorithm. So so you're asking people questions. Um, how do you know they're giving you honest answers? And and I, I I ask that question for very specific reasons that will be evident in a moment. How do you know the answers are legitimate? Okay, so in experimental economics, one of the 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 main rules, like a commandment is we almost always pay people, unless we can't, like with children sometimes or what have you, we almost always pay people money or something we know they value based on the decisions they made. Mm -hmm. So when we do these kind of risk assessments, again, not with clients, but say in a simple experiment for modest amounts of money, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, what we'll do is we say at the end, we're gonna pick one of the things you said you wanted and we're gonna actually play that for money. And if you, if, you, know, if you don't tell us what you really wanted, you're going to get stuck with something you right. didn't want. So you, you're really creating an incentive well. for them to, to be somewhat honest. The, Correct. The, the reason I ask, we're recording this about two weeks before the 2024 presidential election. I wrote something a month ago about why polling errors are really a behavioral problem. Because when you ask people uh, who you're going to vote for, what you're really asking is not just their preference, but hey, you're going to get your lazy butt off the couch and go to the library and vote. And I assumed, hey, there's an error of 5 6 7% built into that, and that's why polls are so bad. Researching your work about hypothetical bias, I was shocked. The data that you came is when you ask people if they're going to vote, about 70% say they will. In reality, just 45% of them do. That's a massive error of 25%. What value is there in polls when people have no idea what they're really going to do? Yeah, so I mean, I think the best pollsters are know that, and so they try to phrase the question or gather some other data. But it, this is often called acquiescence or yes bias. Right. So when you say people, are you planning to vote? Oh yeah, I'm planning to vote. Well, are you going to are you going to not vote because it's too? Yeah, yeah, I may not vote. What happens if it rains? What happens if you're exactly. busy? What? So, so you can often get numbers that add up to more than 100. You percent know, right. Yeah, I'm going to vote. No, you have 70. percent um, yeah, I probably won't vote 55%. That's 125%. <laughs> the math doesn't math. Um, and you see it, particularly one of the things we studied was product purchases. Mm -hmm. So when you show people new products and say, you know, you think you'd be interested in this, you get way too many yeses. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason new products fail is because somebody who's the product champion inside the firm, like in a consumer products company, looks at this polling data and says, see, see, you know, give me money to roll this out in a test market. Um so what one of the things we have done is to try to see if we didn't we wrote a few papers on this, but I don't feel like we exactly cracked the nut was to see if a combination of what people look at, if you measure where their eyes are looking, mm -hmm. like how often they look back and forth between a price and a product and maybe brain signals could help us predict when they say, yeah, I'm going to vote. Are they really going to vote or not? And neuroeconomics, um, as as I've learned about it through you is you're putting people in a functional MRI machine, you're asking them a series of questions, and you're identifying what parts of the brain are actually lighting up. Correct, exactly. So that, so, and, and by the way, the fMRI is glamorous and fantastic, um, but there's lots of other methods that are used as well. It, 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 you know, it's unnatural because people are in this tube. Right. Uh, it's very loud. You know, if you want to study claustrophobic, if you want to study claustrophobia, you cannot. You right. know, because the claustrophobics won't go in there. Um, but it does give you a picture of the whole brain. And in the, in the case of the 
um, we, the, we did some experiments where we show people the consumer good. And in one condition, the, the first part of the experiment, we say, you don't have to actually buy this, but just tell us, you know, if it was on sale for this price, like yes, no, strong yes, weak yes. So we get a four point scale. And then we surprise them and say, now we're going to show you some different products and these you're going to actually buy. So if you say yes, and we choose that one out of this bin. You, you get it. You have you have to buy it. We're, oh, really? We give you some money, uh -huh. and we're going to take the price out and give you the the residual money and the product, and you're going to leave here with this product. Or I think some of them we have, we have mail it to them on Amazon, mm -hmm. or some of them we actually had you know products there in a in a box. And so the question is, what's going on in the brain when they're seriously thinking about buying something for real versus hypothetical, which is like a survey, right? Um, and what we found was the tricky part is to to predict when people say yes, hypothetical, but um, the brain says no. You know, can you can you see a brain and, and signal? And can you identify that? Uh, modestly well. Right. And it, it turns out the most there's two interesting markers. One is there's a very old area in the brain, old you know evolutionary lizard old, lizard, lizard brain, brain. Right. Yes, yeah, called the midbrain, which is actually where. All of the dopaminergic neurons live, and then and then connect to middle areas of the brain called basal ganglia that are kind of computing reward and value, mm -hmm. and then frontal cortex, which is really putting together the modern portion the of the modern brain. exactly right. like the it's like a thinking cap on top of the monkey mm -hmm. brain, and um, in the midbrain, there's a stronger signal. Um, when they say yes, and they actually do do yes hypothetical, and it's a yes real, mm -hmm. there's a stronger signal than when they say yes hypothetical, no real. So it's almost like way upstream in the brain. Um, if 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 in that region they say yes, I'm going to buy it hypothetically. There's enough activity, they're going to buy it. So my general sense of this, and I'm curious as to how you uh, what what the reality is. My sense of it is. On the one hand, people are social animals and they want to be agreeable and exactly. say yes to people. Uh, on the other hand, we really don't know what the hell we want, especially if you're talking about something six months from now. Um, I guess the tricky part is how do you get people uh, in MRI machines when you have a question for them? We can't even get people to pick up their phone to answer polls. How difficult is it to get subjects to go through this process? Or are these all mostly undergraduates and... You well, know, they're lab um, rats. You can do whatever you want. Some to. of them are undergraduates, uh, although at Caltech, um, they're very unusual human beings because they're <laughs> they're actually useful. They're very useful lab rats for behavioral economics because the median math ACT is 800. They're, right. they're the most mathematically skilled wow. people, except for that's some a perfect places. score, isn't it? Like exactly, that's the perfect score. Like Harvey Mudd, MIT. There are other places that have you know similarly hi hyper analytical kids. Um, so if like if they can't do something like a computation mm -hmm. easily, nobody can. So it's very useful for establishing like bounds on rationality. Right. You know, that people we often get critiques like, well, you wouldn't get bubbles if people were smart enough. Like, well, we have the smartest people and you get bubbles. Um, <laughs> it's got less to do with the frontal cortex and intelligence the, exactly. and everything with that it's limbic else. system and the lizard brain back. Yes, yeah, so exactly. So they have the, they have all the things in the brain. They have they have other skills that are cortically expressed. Um but uh, so in, in a lot of these MRI studies, we also use we work pretty hard actually to get regular folks from the community who and who, you know, are different ages. We, you know, we we don't really have a representative sample, although you could you could try to get pretty close in Southern mm -hmm. California. Um, and then we 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 almost always never do a study that's just take Caltech undergrads mm -hmm. because we worry about the robustness across. Right. It, it is true in the case of something like trying to get brain signals to break when people will actually buy products. Um, the other type of study we've used involves eye tracking and things like that. And it turns out that when when you ask people hypothetical questions, would you buy that? You don't really have to buy this, but would you? They just don't look at the price that much. Right. And when they're really shopping, they really look at the price. Mm -hmm. So one way to tell whether people are being serious in expressing a genuine, what I'm, I'm going to really do it, is just something like how much time they spend looking at the price and looking back and forth. Huh. And there may be other... Like if if um, if a consumer products company was trying to use fMRI or other methods, there are others that are much more portable, like EEG, and you can get a pair of glasses. You walk around, and it you know it records where your eyes looking. So there are there are things you can do outside of the confines of a campus lab. Um, I think we would just look for things that are 
that are easy, easily seen biomarkers of this midbrain activity and fMRI because we're never going to be able to do that, you know, at scale in a shopping mall or something. So let's go through each of these. We know what fMRI is, right? You're in a an mm-hmm. MRI machine, EEG and SCR. Tell us what those do. So EEG is electroencephalography, and it's basically all the you, little things on your yeah, head. Yeah, you paste little electrodes. A, mm-hmm. um, if you're bald like me, that's good for it's science. Easy. Right. <laughs> you know, if you're a supermodel with big puffy um, Texas beauty pageant hair, then no good. No good. Um, so you're measuring electrical activity in the brain, and you could really specify where it is by, uh, you know, just triangulating with all the different uh, leads that you yeah, put on your head? Yeah, basically, exactly. So the, the, you know, you can put 16 to 128 different wow. electrodes. The signals are very weak, but the advantage of EEG is it's really fast. So if you want to study something like thinking fast and slow, mm-hmm. you know, like if I show you a picture of a person and you have a snap reaction that they're scary or they're someone you want to vote for, then fMRI is too slow because it measures these blood flow signals that take like one or two seconds to right. show up. But EEG it, like is really one good. one or two seconds is too slow for, for you know a lot is going on in the, in the first two seconds where people are thinking out a huh. decision. Um, That's really interesting. Not necessarily. You know which mortgage to finance the refinance their house in, or who to literally system one thinking fast, system two thinking slow. Exactly. So it's it's it's, the term psychology, social psychology use is also called thin slicing, Uh which is that, and the thin slice is on the order of meaning a a very aggregate, somewhat confident judgment is made within you know ten seconds, thirty seconds. There's a big literature in 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 interviewing about this that you know face to face interviewing, unless you're really trained to have a comparable interview for different people you know the first couple of minutes of the interview you're kind of making up your mind huh. um at least a lot of studies indicate that and and scr is what so scr skin conductance uh, response um also called galvanic skin response and so basically it turns out when people are aroused uh in any any direction it doesn't tell you good or bad but it just tells you arousal you have this detectable increase in sweating you can measure in the fingers so and and in all of these things, you're actually taking measurements, not asking people things. And and one of the quotes that caught my attention, since most of our brain activity goes on without our awareness, subconsciously, we cannot solely rely on individuals' accounts when analyzing their behavior. How important is the concept of the subconscious to to neuroeconomics? Um, it's pretty important. So the saying we use is sometimes you want to ask the brain rather than ask the person. Uh-huh. Um, and there's some there's some extreme re- ways in which that works. For example, if I show a, a face of somebody who's expressing fear, but only for 30 milliseconds, which is, which is one movie frame. Right. Right. And then I, I show a mask, when you're meaning another face right on top that's neutral. Uh, or in another condition, I show a happy face, very enthusiastic, and then neutral mask. If you ask people, did you see a happy or fearful face? They say, like, I have no idea. I didn't see. I didn't see either one. Mm-hmm. But if you look at amygdala activity, which is a region that's known to be rapidly detecting potential threats and, and including fear, uh, the amygdala activity will respond to fear, not um, in thirty milliseconds, not um, huh. not happiness in the same way. So the the brain knows. It's just that it doesn't get to the like the publicist's desk, you know, <laughs> right. to good consciousness. So I'm so glad you said you. it that way. So don't ask the person, ask the brain. How do you think of the different parts of the brain? So obviously the amygdala and and any of the, is it fair to say that's part of the limbic system? Yes. Um, so when you're talking about the publicist, what portion of the brain are we discussing? Um, well, in terms of sheer territory, it's probably not very much. Mm-hmm. Um, Forebrain, hindbrain, where, where? yeah, prefrontal cortex mm-hmm. would be, and 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 um, uh, there's a lot of sensory processing that's going on, you know, pre-conscious or b- like before we could say, you know, motion to something or use words to explain what's going on. I I think it's it's. It's genuinely hard to pin down a number. Like, is you know, if I read, for example, it's ninety percent subconscious and ten percent right. conscious. I don't know if that's right, and it may vary across life cycle. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, you know, we usually we're reluctant to 
pin down a number. I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of things that are going on. We usually say implicitly mm. that are not people aren't explicitly aware of enough enough to make it very interesting. So, so whenever I hear people talk about you know things happening within the brain that you're not aware of, I always think of the split brain experiments and bingo. The, um, tell us a little bit. What does that reveal about our decision making process? Yeah, so the split brain was actually. Uh, first explored by Roger Sperry at Caltech, actually, and his student, Mike Kazaniga, um, you know, made a big chunk of career uh, over out of it. And so the split brain patients means they don't have much communication between left and right hemispheres. Corpus callos- the, callosum, is that right? Bingo, you're A plus. So, you're, so you're, you're, you, these are, uh, the one I remember was, uh, it was some seizure or epilepsy, and they found cutting that stopped the seizures. But then your left brain and your right brain don't really communicate anymore. Exactly. So, for example, so so if you have um, a breakdown of corpus callosum, the right and left aren't really communicating. They're, despite the right brain, left brain, most modern neuroscientists don't think there's that much specialization. There's some interesting kinds. But one kind that's pretty rugged is language is mostly in the left brain in regions mm-hmm. called Broca's area, Wernicke's area. And we know that because you know when you have specialized damage in that area, you can see people start to talk differently. Like they can remember, they can't remember words, but the aphasia. I remember reading about people who can speak, could write, but couldn't read. Just all sorts of wacky things happen when when those two areas are damaged. Correct, exactly. So there are these very localized, pretty well understood aphasias that have to do with local damage. So there's there's often a, what we call plasticity where another part of the brain will take over. So mm-hmm. if you had some damage as a young child, it might be that the aphasia, you know, another another part of the brain like takes over that function. But if it happens later in life, not so. Anyway, so language is somewhat specialized to left region. So for example, if someone with a, and um, the, the sensory systems are contralateral. So the right side of the brain sees the left side of a mm-hmm. picture, left side sees the right side. So suppose I show you on the left of a picture, um, uh, a picture of a friend of yours. And I asked the person, um, if you see this friend of yours, what might what what gesture might you do or what might you, if you see a friend here as opposed to a house or a shovel, what would you do? And the person waves their hand. Mm-hmm. And then you ask them, why did you wave your hand? Now the left side of the brain has to answer the question because that's the language area. But the left side doesn't know that the right side saw a friend and that's why they waved so the left side makes stuff up confabulates an uh, an explanation for why they're waving exactly it's like the publicist for you know for a very guilty uh person and or mike gazaniga calls it the interpreter Mm -hmm. so the interpreter says i don't really know why so i'll kind of make give a plausible answer and they'll say something like oh i saw somebody i knew walking by out the window outside um so that's an example of where we know what the brain saw and why the wave occurred, but the left part of the brain doesn't know. Hmm. That, that's really that's really fascinating. Let's stay with the idea of tracking eye movement. So you could do this with glasses. You can do with this this with a computer. When you're tracking eye movement, asking people about, hey, would you purchase this product? How big of a tell is it when they look at the price, and and is it something they just kind of glance at? Or is it a repeated and obvious, they're focusing on the cost? There, yeah, there's, there's sort of two interesting markers. For, number one, it's not that big of a tell. Mm-hmm. So if we try to predict whether they're going to actually buy something, we might get, say, 42% right. And with the the eye tracking data, it might get up to like 54. Mm-hmm. You know, So as academics, we think that's kind of a modest effect size. Right. Now, if you're running a business and you want a 2% lift and purchase, sure. maybe a billion dollars, right? So sometimes we're a little cautious as academics about, is this a big deal or not? Whereas some of these things, the same in the world of nudges and so on, sometimes a small, you know, a, a half percent increase in get out the vote, if we could do that, you know, scientifically, may well decide an election, right? Anyway, so the, the, the lift is not that big. But the two tells are basically looking at the price. Mm -hmm. And the other is refixation, which basically means not just looking once, but going back and forth. You know, it's the the rapid brain equivalent on a one or two second basis of, say, a couple who's shopping for a house going to look at a second time and a third time. You know, the Hmm. repeated looking. Right. Usually good signal. Exactly. Tells you they're serious. Huh. That that's really interesting. So so give us some examples of what the studies or the experiments look like 
when you're doing eye tracking? What are you trying to, what parts of the brain are you looking at, or is it just the eye tracking? Is it is this uh, by itself, or can you combine this with other types of uh, uh, of neuroeconomics? Yeah, so actually, the eye trackers we use, which are commercially made for science, basically, and sometimes for clinical uh, use, they use cameras to, to look at what the where the eye is looking, and they sync that up with where on the computer screen you're looking. Um, and so besides the location of where the eyes are looking, you also measure pupil dilation. Mm-hmm. And pupil dilation turns out to be, you know, the eyes are the window to the soul. So the, the pupils actually generate a lot of information, although it's, it's crude. It, what the pupil dilation is telling you is about cognitive difficulty. Mm-hmm. Am I having a hard time thinking about this? And arousal, which again may be negative or positive. It's like so. Wide pupil is, is you're aroused. Tight Correct. pupil is you're sure having a hard time. Exactly. With it. Exactly. Huh. And so, um, I think if you trained yourself, and maybe depending on the the color of the eyes, you might be able to tell. Like a poker player might be able to train themselves with a to notice pupil dilation. But just in case, that's why poker players often will wear right. glasses. Dark because sunglasses, yeah. The, the sunglasses, right? Because the idea is if you look at your cards and you have two aces, your pupil will dilate. <laughs> like, and, and it might be hard to see with the naked eye, but the machines we use can definitely see it. That would mm-hmm. be a big jump, you know, a big tell. And so we're able to use pupil dilation and eye tracking to judge things like cognitive difficulty. A lot of the early studies actually were used in game theory because in game theory, the assumption is if I might want to see what my opponent's payoff is in order to decide what they're going to do. And if you ask people, what are you looking at on this computer screen? You know, there's there's a four by four matrix of numbers and I'm trying to think of what you're going to do. There's a lot to look at. And if you ask people for a self-report, they're not going to tell you exactly what their eyes are doing the whole time. They're probably looking at 42 different things, sometimes very quickly. Sometimes they're going back and looking again and again and again. They just don't have conscious access to that process the way that the eye tracking does. So so that's really fascinating the, that speaking to the brain but not the person gives you a whole lot more insight into the decision-making process. Ta- speaking generally... What does this tell us about people as, you know, rational, profit-seeking um, actors in, in the world of, of finance and investing? I think it's useful to think about, say, young, naive investors, or they may be young, but people who have less knowledge about the markets and people who've spent a lot more time thinking about estimating fundamentals, reading 10Ks, um, you know, having years of trading experience. Because an, another important fact, which we try to um, keep track of in behavioral economics, is that a lot of decisions and structures people have to make are not things that we're necessarily evolved to be particularly good at, but people are also extremely good at learning and able, you know, and able to like collect memories and distill things into um, into knowledge. So let me turn to the concept of price bubbles because I think sure. that's a useful one. So we have a couple of one fMRI um, study on price bubbles, and we have some new stuff that includes skin conductance measurement to see if you know can you kind of predict when a crash is coming from people's hands, you know, reflecting nervousness. It, it looks like we can predict a little, but not great. It, you know, that's a high mountain to climb. Mm-hmm. What we found in our first fMRI study about bubbles was um, people trade an artificial asset. So we know the value, the fundamental value of the asset, which we never know in, you know, in natural markets. And the, the price is completely what they agree upon. Mm-hmm. So typically what happens is the, the fundamental value is a number that we control, uh, which happens to be 14. And the, so the value of the asset comes from the fact that if you hold at the end of a period of trading, you get a dividend. Mm-hmm. Or you can invest currency in a risk-free bonds. And so the, the trade-off between the risk-free earnings and the value of the dividends establishes an equilibrium price. It's a very simple equation. Sure. Um, and typically the price starts around 14 and goes up to maybe 20 or 30 and then crashes. And then and then, in order to bring the experiments to a close, we have them trade for 50 periods or 30 periods. And at the end, they were able to cash the assets out at 14. Mm-hmm. So what would you pay for an asset that you'll get 14 for Correct. after a series of dividends, 30 or 50 trading periods exactly. in the future? And so so put yourselves in the mindset of somebody who in period 31, the price is 60. 
Right. And you, you kind of know that in period 50, 19 periods from now, it's going to be 14. Sell. Well, unless you think it's going to go up to 75. Right. Right. So it, it's, tr- it's true. And, and in fact, I'm, it, that's very helpful for me. So what we found from the brain was that there was two interesting signals. I'll start with the more interesting one. The other one's a little more obvious. The interesting signal is people who sold uh, before the bubble crash, which was the smart thing to do. And again, the bubble crash is not announced. It's something you only see as dorky looking back after, in the sure. rearview mirror. Right. Say, same in natural markets. Also, exactly. You know. Just like in natural <laughs> markets, right? Bubbles are only d- shown in hindsight. Gene Fama has written a lot about this. Right. It's one reason he's skeptical that that we should even talk about bubbles, you know, as a scientific uh, phenomenon. Okay. I, I think he goes too far with that. But anyway. A- anyway. Yeah. You know what I mean. Um, so it turns out the people who are more likely to sell when the price is at 60 and we know it's going to crash, but we're not sure when, mm-hmm. um, have heightened activity in insular cortex, uh-huh. which is a, another region that's involved in emotion and interoception. So interoception means- N- Knowing what's going on on the inside of your own body, like a ex- self-awareness? Exactly. So perception is the outside world. Interoception is the brain's, like the body's ambassadorship to the brain, You know, knowing if I'm nervous or- mm-hmm. And it's often um, activated- by particularly by negative emotions so mm-hmm. if you see something disgusting insula if you if you choke a person a little bit or you you know you cut off the oxygen not mm-hmm. so it's dangerous but just to make them uncomfortable insula really? financial uncertainty insula and so we think of the it's insula is the early warning signal that there's going to be a crash and the other interesting brain region is, is nucleus accumbens, which is basically a reward center in what's called striatum, um, part of basal ganglia in the very center of the brain. And that's active in the people who are fueling the bubble. Like when the bubble's, you know, forming, the people who have the highest nucleus accumbens activity buy the most. So you, you have a run of traders participating in this, and you could tell by the brain activity who's contributing to the bubble and who's saying, this is getting crazy, I want to yes. take my chips off the table. Yes. Now, number one, we can't tell with exquisite precision. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we, you can sort of see these groups and we're only looking at this ex post. Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's conceivable, but challenging to do this in real time. You know, so there's you're watching the market unfold. You're doing real time fMRI measurement that can be done, um, and and it's like okay, traders seven, nine, and eleven. You know, we think they're probably going to sell. They're the skeptics. They're the the bulls. And fourteen, seventeen, and twenty one. Their nucleus accumbens activity seems they're really all in. They're going to be forming the bubble and so on and so on. I mean, we're a f- we're a few steps away from being able to do it, but we see these as what we call proofs of concept. Like mm-hmm. it, it can be done. It may take a few million dollars. Any donors are listening, <laughs> <laughs> but it makes perfect sense that that is possible. Di- different parts of the brain are responding to different inputs, um, and, and it's consistent with what we've observed amongst sure. you know just mm-hmm, mm-hmm. various investors and traders. There are people with as the you know in the latter stages of a bull market, they think it's just going to keep going forever, and they pile in. And the flip side of that, there are people, uh, the famous irrational exuberance speech by Alan Greenspan. In 1996, you still had a ton of of gains until the March 2000 top. So some people, uh, I'm just curious what, what drives that. Now that you know what to look for and how to measure it in traders in real time, what do you think is the underlying drivers of whether a person is going to be participating in one tribe or the other? Uh, that's a great question. I, I'll say a little tiny bit more about that. So you, you mentioned the term irrational exuberance, which mm-hmm. was coined, as I recall, by Bob Schiller in his book about... Um, I think it was from the irrational exuberance speech. Oh, no, he, um, uh, Schiller may have helped Greenspan... With that speech, if I'm remembering, because I've Could seen, be, yeah. I've seen both. Whether it was Schiller's phrase yeah, yeah. or Greenspan's speech, it may speech. be, it may be, you know, it's kind of combination. Lost in history. Yeah, yeah. Some, you know, it was some apocryphal. We, you know, we're not sure exactly who said it first, but certainly there was a kind of meeting of the minds that this was mm-hmm. a useful. And in fact, when we didn't, we used the phrase in our paper, but we didn't put it in the title. It just seemed a little too unscientific. It's okay for USA Today or something, but right. this is the. Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, you know, and um, but we think of this nucleus accumbens activity. That's the that's the measure of irrational exuberance, mm-hmm. and the irrational part is, 
you know, when it's too high, you're going to end up paying a high price uh, for something that crashes fast. Huh. So this, the rational is really in, in there, um, literally. But yeah, and and also we, when I present this in ac- academic seminars and uh, later today, I'm meeting some Caltech people. We talk about this famous um, saying from Warren Buffett, I believe, when people are afraid, be greedy. When people right. are greedy, be afraid. And in the, this brain area is like insula is similar to fear and greed and nucleus accumbens. You know, it's about as close as you're going to get to to brain areas matching what Warren Buffett had to say, which was such a wise thought. So, so you really kind of answered the question I was about to ask, which is why has behavioral economics been so successful describing decision making where traditional economics seems to have faltered? But what you're really saying is – we don't know what's going on in our brain when we're making decisions as individuals. And when you look underneath the hood, it turns out there's a lot more things happening than at least classical economics seems to imply. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and also, this isn't something we've carefully researched, but but I think it's a good speculation for your audience, which is – when it, like when I was going to Chicago in the late seventies, all of my graduate student friends were also kind of critics of, of nobody liked behavioral economics at that time. Oh, um, really? Oh, yeah. It was, um, you know, people said things like, "I think you know, I'm worried you might be ruining your career because you switched out of finance." And um, well, and w- what it was was there was a series of of critical questions, which were, "But if people make all these mistakes, couldn't someone profit from?" you know, arbitrage or right. from selling them crappy goods. I'm like, well, it seems like that may happen, you know? Right. Or if people make these mistakes, don't they learn over time not to make mistakes? That may also happen. It may be that there's a sucker born every minute, but there's a, you know, a generational process. Mm-hmm. And markets are always filled with some combination of new investors or, you know, sovereign funds of people who aren't very savvy about markets or something like that. So early in the history of behavioral economics, there was really a lot of, uh, hostility about it. Um, and then we gradually, one thing about Chicago and, and the economics profession in general is data do win arguments. Mm-hmm. So ideology will often persist. Like for Gene Fama, for example, he's he'll always be skeptical about behavioral finance um, for his own reasons and, and you know, their, their ideas. But um, but eventually data win arguments. And, there, there, you know, we, there were just so many anomalies and ways in which investors were making mistakes. And, and it wasn't just small investors, you know, who were refinancing their mortgage mistakenly. It was, you know, some of these implicit things may be very big, you know, like venture capitalists joked about how, well, you know, when I, I think of Mark Zuckerberg in a hoodie, and that's kind of my template for a good founder to invest <laughs> tens of millions of dollars. Right, in. Like, right. That's not as sophisticated. That's not home economicus. Right? And, that's behavioral and economics. I recall reading one of the papers Bob Schiller wrote was looking at dividend yield mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. saying if if markets are fully pricing in all data, why does this dividend yield swing around so much? It should be much more consistent than this. Correct. Uh, but apparently it's not. Uh, I just... I was very amused by Fama and Schiller being awarded the Nobel yeah, yeah. <laughs> together. It's almost as if the committee said, look, markets are kind of efficient, and except when they go crazy. You two guys work it out. Yes. Yeah, the, yeah it was quite a um, – it was kind of a charming and I, and I think sensible award for that reason. And the, you know, the journalist said, like, well, is there – you know, one person says A is true, one says A is not always true. Like, how could you give that award? The answer is they both made made a lot of progress, you know, in, in different ways. Let's talk about some of the other ways that we can look inside. Are, are we looking at things like adrenaline or dopamine or any of the sort of hormones that seem to affect our behavior when, when we're trying to analyze decision making? Yeah. So actually, um, that's a very good question, Barry. The, um, neuroeconomics uses a lot of different methods. The fMRI is sort of like, you know, the movie star in a family with four sisters, you know, the, the glamorous one that everyone pays attention to, but is actually high maintenance. And then, but all the other siblings are, you know, kind of contributing in some interesting way. So um, pharmacology is something people are really interested in. Meaning specifically it, pharmacology drugs that are in your yeah, system so pharmacology, or hormones? So pharmacology is drugs, mm-hmm. but, but some of those, for example, L-DOPA will actually... 
um, ramp up dopamine levels, mm-hmm. and you can see if some interesting things happen. L dopa is a drug you can consume, correct, in, in order to raise your dopamine. Exactly. Levels. So it's it's ba- L dopa is basically administered. To, so Parkinson's patients mm-hmm. have a um, degradation of dopamine, mm-hmm. and so to kind of ramp them up to normal levels, L dopa is often used in treatment. Pharmacology is one. What are some of the other four systems? Um, so we we do look at neurotransmitters like oxytocin, arginine vasopressin is one that we've studied. GABA. Oxytocin sounds a lot like oxycontin. Any Correct. overlap? <laughs> no, okay. No, exactly. So oxytocin is um, is sometimes called as like an affiliation hormone. So for mm-hmm. example, if you get a really pleasurable massage, you might feel a surge of oxytocin. Um, when my wife was um, giving birth, they often, to induce labor, they often give somebody synthetic oxytocin. Mm-hmm. And oxytocin is also produced after birth and when the mom is first coming with the baby and probably the dad, although maybe less. You know, it's this very pleasurable thing that makes you want to like hug somebody and feel feel affiliated. Mm-hmm. Affiliated is this sort of bio term. So there's a bunch of studies on oxytocin suggesting that improve trust. Hmm. But there's a cautionary tale, which is we, me and some colleagues went back and looked at those carefully. And uh, it is, seems that giving people artificial, giving people oxytocin for a, a, a modest dose and then seeing what happens, you know, an hour later, it improves trust a little bit, but it's, it's scientifically very, very tricky. And mm-hmm. some of the standard results if you do the same exact experiment over again, you just don't always get the same result. So mm-hmm. we don't know how sturdy oxytocin is. What What are some of the other chemicals you mentioned, neurotransmitters so, uh, you mentioned? So when we studied, I'll, I'll say a little bit, it was arginine vasopressin. Uh-huh. And so that's another hormone um, which is similar to oxytocin and that when when animals are are bonding in groups, this arginine vasopressin sort of, you know, you'll get a surge and it shows that. So um, when, when you say bonding in groups, I'm thinking of a wolf pack or a hyena pack where yes. they're cooperative species that work together and uh, there are chemicals that contribute to that. Is yes. that is that what we're yeah, suggesting? Exactly. exactly. So, so part of me wants to say we're just meat sacks operating obliviously to what's going on underneath our skin where where we think it's free will but it sounds like there's a lot of things happening oh, below yeah, yeah. the surface that's really in influencing our decision making yeah oh absolutely i mean th- think about things like breathing you know <laughs> breathing is so automatic right. then when we stop and do sort of breath work and try to think about it like uh-huh. the navy seals might have a breathing exercise to calm down before a terrifying thing they have to take you know, it actually takes a lot of executive function to think about breathing because we never have to. Because it's automated, it's right. It's because it's so automated. So the, the fact that it's actually grabs a lot of attention is because the automation is, is we've completely flipped back in the opposite situation. Let me tell you an organine vasopressin study we did. So there's a game similar to Prison Dilemma, but not the same, called the Stag Hunt Game. And the idea is two people decide to show up in the morning and hunt for a stag. It's, it's a very old-fashioned name from the... Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the 1600s. We're talking about a, a, a male deer. elk or deer? Yeah, yeah, an elk or deer, yeah. The point of the stag is it's so big that no one person can't catch themselves. Mm-hmm. One person has to spot and the other to shoot or something like that. Or they, they can not show up in the morning at the appointed spot and just hunt for rabbits on their own. Mm-hmm. And so the structure of the game, when we do it with money uh, or reward with, with animals, is you get one point if you just go for rabbit, If you both hunt for stag, you get two if you hunt for stag. But if you show up by yourself, prepared to hunt for stag, you can't catch any, you get zero. Mm -hmm. And so the choosing a rabbit is choosing one and not helping your friend. Both showing up for stag is better for the both of them, but they have to somehow coordinate that activity. And so what we found was when you give people this AVP, and it's a crossover design, which means sometimes they get AVP and sometimes they get a placebo mm-hmm. because there's a you know well-known placebo effect where if they think maybe they got the AVP, it might subconsciously affect the right. behavior. So we always control for placebo effects, just like in drug trials, you know, the same thing, very routine. When you give them AVP, they're more likely to choose stag, which is the socially risky and beneficial thing. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like it generates this willingness to join the group in a way that's going to help everybody if another if enough people join. Um, and the, the other thing that was really nice in this paper was um, we, we also used fMRI. So we had two groups of people 
tr- with administering AVP, one group was scanned and one was not scanned, which is just to see, like, to replicate, do you get the same behavioral thing if they're not, you know, boom, boom, boom in the scanner. And in the scanner, you see activity in globus pallidus, which is known to be, it's a small region. It's not one of the more familiar areas, you know, that show up a lot over and over in our economics, like basoganglia, um, amygdala, insula, PFC. But you do see activity in globus pallidus when people um, under AVP are choosing STAG. So it looks like the, the AVP is sort of promoting the STAG choice. But when we see people working cooperatively, you see a similar neurotransmitter Correct. Uh, as you do in the pack animals. Exactly. And it's, and, it's, and it's causal, right? So these are the, a group of people, and sometimes they just get this drug. Um, and it, it makes it, them want to cooperate. And it makes them other. want to cooperate in a, in a way that be, with this risky but benefits the group. But we sometimes think of it, it, it overcomes their inhibition to, to be, well, I don't know if you're going to choose stag and sh- I don't know if you're going to show up. Well, the prisoner's dilemma is you're always better off throwing the other person Correct. under the bus. Um, this is not that. And, and because this here, is the if opposite. the other person helps out, you want to help out too. It's right. the best response. So it's different structurally than... The prisoner's dilemma. So, so I keep coming back uh, every time I read a new anything about behavioral finance, neuroeconomics, anything about this. I, I can't help but come back to the conclusion that all of our evolutionary biology has led us to a state where we're so well adapted to um, adjusting to changes in the natural world. And all of those things that have developed over the millennia really don't help us in the modern world. If anything, it, it's prob- certainly in investing, it seems to be pretty problematic. Yeah, exactly. In fact, that's called the evolutionary mismatch hypothesis. Oh, really? And, and the, I didn't know it had a name. Yes, exactly. So, so we tell us about- the, We can call it the Rit- Ritholtz hypothesis. <laughs> if, I, if only. <laughs> so, so this mismatch is simply- we evolved to adapt on the savanna, and that doesn't help us figure out which bonds to buy. Is it that simple? Exactly, exactly. So um, another way to think of it is is institutions, sometimes it's families, it's political advertisement. It might be fine print about fees in a you know in a in a financial advertisement. Those are all th- things that are kind of tricking or or exploiting vulnerabilities in our basic ancestral biology. Now, again, People are smart too, so there's there is adaptation and kind of plasticity. So, over a lifetime, you might, or, or maybe in one MBA course, or right. even possibly a high school course, you might learn some principles of basic finance that really help you avoid dumb mistakes. You know, right. like compound interest really compounds quickly. Right. You know, the the the, the caveman brain thinks compounding quickly. I've, I have no idea what that means. My brain can't imagine that if I invested in the S and P a thousand dollars forty years ago, how much I'd have. You know, I can't compute that number. Right. Well, we but, live in I mean, an arithmetic world. Exponential numbers exactly. are hard yeah, to comprehend. The, yeah, the, the brain is mostly linearizing things. Right. That, that, that and if they're not linear or they're dramatically nonlinear, like pandemic, right. um, uh, compound interest. We can learn to overcome it, but we need these kind of external tools. It's almost mm-hmm. like exoskeleton, you know, whether it's education, advisors, and so on. So let's talk a little bit about risk aversion, which has been this behavioral finance concept. People dislike losses twice as much as they enjoy gains. Um, what does the world of neuroeconomics say about loss aversion? I've seen a few mathematicians claim, oh, it's just a statistical anomaly. Mm-hmm. I, I remain unconvinced that that's the case. Yeah. So actually, we, I know a lot about loss aversion. We we published a meta-analysis last year about- There's a reason I'm asking the, you this yes, question. It's exactly. not out of left field. Right. Um, <laughs> you came to the right place. Um, <laughs> so in the meta-analysis, we looked at hundreds of studies, basically every study we could find you know, using informatics. And nowadays, you can really do this. It's like a industrial fishing. You know, mm-hmm. you throw this net out and you get- 4,000 studies, then you winnow it down to the ones that are really just all trying to measure the same thing so you can add them up. There was something like 370 estimates of lambda, which is the Greek symbol that means the ratio of the disutility of loss to gain. And as you mentioned, two is sort of a, we think it's a little bit smaller, like 1.7, but you know, it's an- Comparable. It's, it, it, yeah, it's comparable. And it's not one, which which would be the case in which you're not distinguishing loss and gain at all. You know, They're just like one scale. Um, 
So the evidence is pretty good. Um, some other fun facts about loss aversion, which is you might think that loss aversion is, is a, some kind of handicap. But actually, we published a paper with two people who have brain damage and bilateral amygdala, uh-huh. which means neither part of the amygdala can compensate for the other. This is a very unusual disease. It comes from a Urbach Vieta disease, and they basically the amygdala is kind of like calcified, so it's it's there, but it's like deep freeze. You know, so, it just so doesn't you, work. You these people lose the ability to have these emotional responses Correct. to stimulus. Correct. Correct. Um, and a lot has been known about them because they've been studied. My, one of my colleagues, Ralph Adolf, has studied um, uh, several of them for years, and they, um, you know, they come back every so often and do a different kind of task. And um, so let me guess, they're pretty good traders. Generally, they're in disability because um, uh-huh. the amygdala damage is enough to make. They basically take too much risk in a lot of areas huh. of life. Um, so, so they're risk embracing, not risk averse exactly. at all. So, the, so the the idea that that risk and fear are there to kind of protect you mm-hmm. it, it applies to them like when you remove that like one of the patients sm makes a lot of poor choices um give us examples well uh, the uh, example i recall i hope i'm not getting that my memory's not mangling it too badly is she went on some kind of a date and the person was very sexually aggressive and she ended up okay and then somebody said well would you want to go out with that person again she said yeah yeah it was sure. fine it was fine <laughs> you know she just didn't have this trauma the, the amygdala was not processing this is really bad run away run away avoid avoid so so how does this manifest itself amongst investors making risk decisions if their ability to process threats process fear is in present what 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 happens with those sort of decisions well so so for these two patients with amygdala damage they have no loss aversion None whatsoever. None. In fact, so aggressive traders and investors. Well, so and yeah. So the way we measure is we give them these financial, simple financial risks. Like you could win. Most people, if you say you could win ten, um, but you might lose eight or might lose seven, they're kind of just indifferent because a loss of seven and a gain of ten or you know if it's I one could, and a half. If I could do that on a billion dollars, I, I would. You know, exactly. I'd love to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But. Um, but these two, so damage the amygdala, no more loss aversion. So huh. that's partly a reminder that. Um, be careful what you wish for, right? right? Um, like you don't want to react emotionally to everything. Correct. Right? The The reason it's so hard to do what Warren Buffett says is when everybody's clamoring to buy, you get ca- most people get caught up in that enthusiasm where we're social primates. And when the group is screaming, buy, 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 it's very hard to go the other direction. Yes. And then at the bottom, when everybody is selling, uh, the fear is so palpable. It's, exactly. it's, the fear is almost contagious. Yeah, almost like very much so. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you lose that risk aversion. Do you have the ability to just go opposite the crowd because you don't care? It, it could be. I mean, I've, um, I have a feeling successful traders, it's, it's not that they're not loss averse, but they manage to inhibit it somehow. Or... Mm-hmm. Uh, we we did a su- study in this, but it's, I don't think the details are all that interesting for your readers. But or they're able to do what we call bracketing or kind of portfolio view, mm-hmm. which is to say you have bad days and good days, and at the end it's my you know it's my P and L at the end of the month or at the end of the year or at the end of the quarter, and manage to kind of shrug off a, a loss. Mm-hmm. Now I don't think that's that easy to do if you have intact amygdala, right? right? So it's it's almost, it's, it, it leads into another interesting topic which we've studied a little bit called emotion regulation, mm-hmm. which is the fact that a lot of our emotions are sort of involuntary. You know, if there's a loud boom, you and I are both going to have this fear reaction, you know, hair will stand up, we'll freeze. Um, but you can also learn to, to regulate emotions. I mean, mm-hmm. kids are learning that when, when they learn to, you know, not be too afraid on the first day of school. Um, as people get older, they learn to regulate emotions. Um, it's a pretty important skill. And so I think successful trading is probably some kind of cocktail of either a little less natural loss aversion, but not too little, mm-hmm. right? Because you don't want to, to, like, going crazy. You don't want them to be immune to loss, just like you don't want your hand to be immune to pain, right? Because you're going to lean on a on a hot um, right. stove one day and not notice that your hand is on fire, right? Uh, so you, you, a good trader probably has a little less natural loss aversion and then a really good ability to emotionally regulate, 
you know, when too much loss is, is acceptable or getting you into trouble. So, so the emotional regulation um, aspect is really interesting. I'm going to push you a little outside of your, your normal, I think, of your normal research area. One of the interesting comments that have come up when discussing who's a great fund manager, who's a great trader, who, who are these folks that have put together these really impressive track records a surprising number of neuroatypical folks. Oh, yeah. The uh, re- reason I asked you this is it seems like not only is there a little bit of ability to manage the emotions, but there's that ability to step outside of the crowd and say, I don't care what the rest of the primates are doing. Here on in March 2009, stocks look really attractive, and I want to be a buyer even though everybody else is selling. I, is there an aspect of that to those sorts of, of Yeah, traders? I think that's a fantastic topic. In fact, it is close to something- Oh, it is. All right, good. Um, we've been thinking about. So one thing is, I, I, wanted, I was going to mention from before. So one of the striking things, I was working on a neuroeconomics book, and I was reading a lot of papers on social conformity. Mm-hmm. It turns out that almost every study finds the typical paradigm is something very stylized and simple, like, you know, you see a face and three other people see the same face and you're asked to say, is this person friendly or unfriendly? And in the conformity case, the other three people say friendly and some other subject, the other three say unfriendly. Mm -hmm. And people, people, there seems to be a reward activity when you conform to the group. Right. And these are not... We're not super stress testing, so we're not quite something like, you know, you're in the d- depth of a, a, a crash, the 2008 crash, and everyone's selling. And, you know, ethically, it's hard for us to generate that dramatic right. of an event in the lab. But so, but even for these mild effects, and a lot of these people, if you ask them, do you follow the crowd? They would say, no, 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 I kind of go my own way. Like if a bunch of people said someone was friendly and you weren't sure, if you thought they weren't friendly, would you disagree? Yeah, 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 I wouldn't bother me. But study after study after study shows there's generally reward value from conformity, which is essentially just the the modern evidence for what you were talking about, which is that part of being a social animal. Right. The is evolution to go of cooperation has uh, has been very successful for us. Exactly. And it's it is hard job. to fight the crowd. It did its job. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Um, so I thought that was quite striking. Again, if you were if you wanted to study anti authoritarian personality it might be a way to get into that. There may be people who are almost pathologically. But let's get back to your point about um, neuroatypical people. So um, we're actually working on it, beginning the, a study on autism. So it's, autism is called a spectrum disorder, which basically right. means it's not like you have it or you don't, like schizophrenia. So, you know, statistically, it's it doesn't look like two humps. Right, two. you have a little, you could have some, you could have more, you can have a lot. Correct, correct. And there's often differences of symptoms. Like extreme autism often involves catatonia and severe language deficits mm-hmm. and what have you. And so when people often think about Asperger's syndrome, which is sometimes called high functioning autism, right? Which is basically you just just socially awkward and hard to understand what people do, but um, a lot of these pathologies or disorders, I should say, pathology is not the right word. A lot of these disorders are accompanied by some enhancement. So, for example, Asperger's patients have are more likely to have perfect pitch for a sound. Huh. They are better at ignoring sunk costs. Which is a classic behavioral economics thing. Right. You know, I, I spent so much on this dessert. I, you know, I came to New York. It's eighteen dollars for some flour. You know, cheap. flourless That's cake. Cheap. <laughs> I have to finish it. Right. Right. The autists. The are money like, is spent whether you get the calories exactly. or not. So Absolutely. the autists have the right idea. Right. Um, and there is a sweet spot. I, I'm going to get you a list. Bingo. Of the people who I know in this field who have put up impressive numbers and have either stated they're on the spectrum Uh or it's kind of obvious, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you could look at film, video, or written statements, and you know, machine learn them, and say this person talks or looks. I'll, like I'll ask on Twitter. Uh, who, yeah, <laughs> who, who's who's on the autism spectrum in the world of finance and has a good track record? But I, I have like two dozen names in my head. I'll give you a name. I would, unfortunately he just he died not too long ago. Charlie Munger. So I oh, got of to course. meet Charlie a few times. Right, and he. he doesn't strike me as a uh, very spectrum me. Well, but w- one marker of autism is is like poor conversational turn taking. 
Mm-hmm. You know, and so when I the times that I met Charlie just twice, and if you see him at the the Berkshire Hathaway, I mean he's he's amazing. I think it was like the Mark Twain of finance for sure. You know, because he was really witty, and but also there was always like a really deep psychological insight in there. You know, it wasn't just funny; it was like funny and true, mm-hmm. and often something other people didn't want to say. Uh, but um, when I met him, he was just like a freight train, and so you had to interrupt. <laughs> And I realized the goal is to not have a conversation. You're just going to move the train in different just directions. Just nudge him in different directions. Right. right. Like, exactly. Well, you know, that reminds me of X. Boom. And then he's off discussing X. I never realized that about him. So you're but saying- anyway, that, that's my non-clinical. I am not a trained uh-huh. clinician. Uh-huh. But, you know, disclaimer. Part of it is reflected in why he was successful. You know, he, he saw himself as an average person who wasn't making the dumb mistakes other people make. But some of those dumb mistakes- people make, you know, he may have not made them because he doesn't get caught up in social conformity or because he's very focused on, he has good metacognition. Like if I don't, I don't buy a company, I don't understand. Right. You know, that's probably a good intuition. Good strategy. So yeah. I'm working on a, a new book. I'm almost done. And Munger is um, oh, great. one of the two people I dedicate the book to. And the quote of his that very much informs the the theme of the book is someone once asked him, was Berkshire successful because you and, and Warren are so much smarter than everybody else? And his response was, it's not that we're smarter than everybody else. We were just less stupid, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. is such an insightful yeah. observation. Yeah. Hey, just fewer, uh, Charlie Ellis, make less unforced errors yeah, and yeah. you'll do better in tennis or investing yeah. than the guy trying to slam the ace in. Most people are not going to get it in. Um, him and Munger had the the two Charlies had the same belief system. Just be less stupid. Mm-hmm, absolutely. It's, it's it's really fascinating. Yeah. yeah uh, totally. uh, so so uh, when you've interviewed Munger, what are some of the takeaways you've had from your conversations with him? Um, one thing I remember was for we, we so we went and looked at our neuroimaging center. He, um, Did you ever get him in a machine? No. Um, I wish we I wish we had. He we, we may, he may have gone for it too. He's a, you know he's a pretty interesting person and I mm-hmm. think very. Open minded to crazy yeah, stuff, it, right? Scientifically curious, yeah, as well yeah. as in, in his, in his um, financial life. He had gone to Caltech for a while, so he was. Um, we got to run into him every so often. Of course, we're always people like that. They're always trying to get them to give money and, right. you know, or at least show up and um, give a speech, something. Uh, yeah, talk. And so, um, so we showed him the brain scanner. He had a really interesting thought, which I didn't quite appreciate till later, which was. Um, he said, what you guys should be doing is if you're trying to change behavior, like let's say you're trying to get somebody to vote or to um, wear a mask or, you know, quit smoking, opioids, the really hard stuff, you know, weight loss. Mm-hmm. He said, what you should really do is rather than doing one little thing, you should go for a Lollapalooza, you know, like basically try to add in six different things to get the biggest ability to get people to quit smoking, let's say. Makes sense. And so he was thinking as a practitioner, like I want, I want to know what's what's going to work as scientists we're often thinking piecemeal mm-hmm. like if we put six different things in and it works we don't know which of the six is the active ingredient but it could be a different combination for each different person exactly so exactly um but and so the reason i was thinking about that was nowadays one of the fallouts or one of the products i should say from fall it's definitely the wrong word one of the products from behavioral economics was this idea of a nudge that often because people are often sensitive to very subtle things like opt in versus opt out, right? You know, there may be a low cost, light touch way to change behavior a little bit. Well, just look at the four hundred one k exactly making the default go to uh, just a, um, a, some specific investment, as opposed to it just sits there in cash, correct? Uh, for for God knows how long. Um, seems to have really had a big impact. Yes, exactly. That that was definitely the the, the poster child mm-hmm. for the simplest nudge, and we kind of understand the psychology of it. Anyway, so so now what a lot of people are thinking about nudges is exactly this Lollapalooza idea of mongers, which is if we want to get people to get out the vote, rather than try six different things, we should be trying like six combinations of three things. Mm-hmm. Statistically, it's messy because you, you, you'll never sure. really end up knowing which of those is the active ingredient, but to just get results, that, that's useful information. It's useful mm-hmm. information. So the nudge um, enterprise, which I've been connected to a little bit, is moving somewhat in that direction that Munger mentioned many years ago. Huh, really interesting. All right, I only have you for a limited amount of time, so let me jump to my favorite questions that I ask all of my guests. 
starting with what are you watching or listening to these days? What's keeping you entertained? So Katie Milkman's podcast, Choiceology, is mm-hmm. one that I've been on that I think is quite good. It's basically the behavioral economics um, podcast. There, there are quite a few others, but Katie is a real expert on this and is a, a great interviewer and has had good guests. Choiceology. Choiceology. Tell us about your mentors who helped to shape your fascinating career. Um, so two people who were on my thesis committees, Robin Hogarth and Hilly Einhorn, were two. And th- th- there's an interesting story. So... Robin was Scottish, um, very verbal. Every sentence started with um, howsoever, therefore, notwithstanding. Hilly was a very blunt Jew from Brooklyn, right. and it was the exact opposite. Right. So Hilly would mark up my thesis and put in all these fancy, uh, Hilly would rather would take out the whatsoevers and the howevers and the therefores. Right. And he was like, put in more, like, boom, like, Short sentences, no semicolons, but mm-hmm. like he had one punctuation mark. Period. That's it. Right. Like you know, he bought he like he bought a million periods at a store, and like I'm not going to use those. And Robin was the other way around. He, oh, this really needs to do semicolon. You know, let's plop this in. And at one point, I was going back and forth. You know, near the completion of my thesis, with the two of them were co-advisors, and I got so frustrated. And I said, "How should I write this?" And we had this this kind of like grasshopper moment of it's your thesis you figure out how you want to write it. Mm-hmm. And I realized they were kind of waiting for me to find my voice, like they say in writing. Right. You know, like, and one of them loved tables and the other loved graphs. So the drafts of my thesis was the table and a graph that were exactly the same thing. Mm-hmm. And I had to decide, was I a graph person or a table person? Or was I kind of like a bilingual? Right. So I basically became kind of bi- bilingual in terms of how I was thinking about science. That was very helpful. The other person probably is Dick Thaler because he... Um, He's a very good writer. He did exactly what so many academics aspire to, and we always ask for more of, which is to write a small number of extremely high-quality papers. Mm-hmm. It's it's very unusual, because for career reasons and stuff, you have to get tenure, and da, da, da. Right. And Dick just couldn't really write a bad paper. I don't write as many great papers as him, and I, as a result, I write too many okay papers. But that's something I think is useful for everyone. He, he's one of my favorite people in the world. I, I got yeah. to interview, I don't know, half a dozen times, uh, only once since he won the Nobel Prize. But I, I always find him so informative and entertaining, and I, I just loved his response to winning the prize. What, what are you gonna do with the money? His answer was, I'm going to spend it as irrationally as I possibly can. It's <laughs> yeah. just so, so yeah. him. He enjoys life. I, he very much does. It just He's just also a fascinating, fascinating, charming guy. Um, let's talk about books. What are some of your favorites? What are you reading right now? Um, I am reading Emma Klein, a book called The Guest, mm-hmm. especially for New Yorkers in your audience. It's about a very grifty, sketchy woman who goes to the Hamptons mm-hmm. and kind of cons her way around the Hamptons. It's really, it's almost like a very... Didn't we have kind of a real life thing like that happening a year or yes, two ago? Yes, exactly. It may, it may be loosely inspired by Anna Delvey in, uh-huh. in Manhattan or some or some similar cases. It's basically a, almost like a, a 19th century novel about class uh-huh. because she's very conscious of not belonging in the Hamptons, but she's very beautiful and kind of charming in this mm-hmm. sort of man-eater, femme fatale way. Uh, and I'm almost done with that. It's really delicious. The other thing, I, I, I love movies and books about capers and heists and grift, which includes Emma Klein, the guest. So I'm reading these books by Jim Swain, who's not uh-huh. well known. I got onto it because Lee Child, who I who I My love. My wife reads all of his books, yeah. plow, plow through all of them. Exactly, yeah. And, and, and that did that include the Reacher series? The Reacher series, yeah. yeah. That's what he's most famous for, yeah. Lee Child. But so Jim Swain was blurbed by Lee Child saying, Jim Swain's the best at what he does. And what he does is he writes about a very sophisticated cheater in Las Vegas who cheats casinos. Mm-hmm. And... It, you know, I'm going to use recycle this in your in the, the, very shortly for you. But um, basically, there are procedurals about how to cheat a casino. Uh-huh. But in the end, if you get caught, there's also this sort of socio psycho political thing of, you know, if I make up a story about why something happened, like if there's a murder in a casino, and I make up a story about it that helps them 
act like the murder was freakish and won't drive away customers. Mm -hmm. I'm actually delivering a gift to them and they're going to trade off. They're not going to send me to jail if I give them this gift. So there's a lot of layers of, this is not Dostoevsky. It's not right. brilliant. This is not this high is fun literature. summer beach reading, yes. it sounds like. But for me, there, there's a lot of like psychology and, you know, in a way it's like game theory. What if there's an arms race between the Vegas... A gaming commission and each of the individual casinos who are very sophisticated. They hire mm. a lot of ex cheats, you know, to, right. to tell them what to look for. And then these cheaters who know, you know, so it's really this arms race of who's going to win. I found those really interesting. Um, if you like books on grifts and cheats and um, uh, corruption, I'm going to recommend uh, pretty please. much anything he's written. I've been a fan of his for years. Carl Hiasen was a reporter. Oh, yeah for the Miami Herald, right. the crime mm -hmm. reporter, and then just one after another, these series of novels. And, and his one of his more recent books is now a, a TV series on Apple Plus, um, Bad Monkey. But, oh, is it? But oh, all yeah. of his books, it's Bad Monkey and the, I think the sequel is called Razor Girl, but all his books take place in Florida. Everybody's corrupt. The police are corrupt. The building inspectors are corrupt. The politicians are corrupt. And there's always one or two good people in the heart of the story. And it's how do they navigate right. this just this endless world. sea of treachery and corruption? Um, and he's just a delightful, entertaining writer. If You, you could randomly yeah, yeah. I've, pick I've any of his books, yeah. uh -huh. and they're just all they're great beach reads. Um, yeah, let me also mention The Wire because I grew up in Baltimore County, mm -hmm. and um, I the read the series. Yes, and David Simon's book The Corner is a kind of a precursor. I mean, he's a very interesting person. He was a reporter, mm -hmm. and um, I think he may have in been Baltimore, a teacher is in that Baltimore. Is that right? Baltimore. Yeah, and The Corner is like this beautiful. I think it was a precursor to The Wire, but it's, mm -hmm. it's basically about a corner in West Baltimore where everyone buy, buys drugs, and it's right. about drug addiction and all the things that surround it. So it's somebody who. You know, one of the things we study in behavioral economics is habits and addictions and, you know, and the neuroscience, of course, is fascinating along the way. And that one is great. And The Wire, having grown up in Baltimore County, which is not Baltimore City, The Wire is almost like a documentary. And it has all this Baltimore stuff as well as Baltimore accents where you can you know, have people talking about talking like this. <laughs> and it has Tommy Garcetti is this political character who's sort of inspired by Tommy D'Alessandro, whose daughter is Nancy Pelosi. Oh, really? That's amazing. I, I found the series The Wire. It's a tough watch. It's a great yeah, show, yeah. It's but gritty. it's brutal. Yeah, Gritty yeah, is, yeah. is mild. I mean, some of the stuff that goes on in the show is just like... Yeah, there's a famous scene with a nail gun, You're, <laughs> um, which if, <laughs> if your listeners have the stomach, that's pretty classic. Um, similar uh, in the Jack Reacher series. There's a... Uh, oh, really? Something not that far off. Yeah. Oh. They toned it down for television, but the book is is really brutal. All right, we're up to our final two questions. What sort of advice would you give to a college grad interested in a career in fill in the blank, neuroeconomics, behavioral finance, or even just investing? For somebody who, say, um, doesn't want to get a PhD, that's a different track and probably of less interest. And there's, You can get a lot of guess, uh, uh, advice on how to do that. I would study not just finance, like straight asset pricing and derivatives, but also um, behavioral economics, game theory, I think, because even mm -hmm. though game theory is usually like two players or small numbers of players, it really sharpens the logic of, you know, when do I know something another person doesn't know? And, and do I know that they don't know it? You, you know, you have to really relentlessly think about the math underlying that. And then there's a lot of experimental and real world data. What am I? I just got it text from our students this term and there's a lot of data from sports about whether sports activities are like equilibrium responses to other players um, hmm. so you can actually there's a, there's a lot of sources of data besides just say the lab experiments i talk about in my book from 2003 sneaking that plug in um, cognitive science is something i would study too so cognitive science is a modern brand of cognitive psych that has more math in it and a lot of it actually goes back to something we spoke about, like evolutionary mismatch, but they're quite interested in what they call resource rationality, which means a lot of the mistakes people might make, like anchoring on one number and being influenced by that, the famous mm -hmm. anchoring adjustment heuristic, may actually be rational if you, if you only have so much working memory or you're under time pressure or you're tired. It's also closely related to the way economists would think about 
uh, mistakes, which is they may be optimal given some constraint. Like, what is that constraint? And can we test that experimentally? So I think there's a lot of stuff you could learn there that will help you think about markets. The other thing I would say is get experience thinking about markets, whether interning or I mean, I'll tell you a story about what worked for me, which mm-hmm. was when I was 12 years old in uh, Cockeysville, Maryland, every August, there was a one month racing program mm-hmm. at a small racetrack called Timonium, Maryland. And it was a five eighths of a mile track. So it's like a, you know, small. Mm-hmm. I would go with my dad and a friend of his who had, was a stockbroker. And we would also go to the big tracks like Pimlico where the Preakness Stakes is. But if you go to Timonium, you get to see all the horses there was so much interest. You learned so much about markets. Uh, it, it, number one, it gives you, I think, a respect for market efficiency. Because the odds are actually not that bad. They're, they're extremely they're good. They're pretty, pretty dead on. Exactly. And so you see, you know, eight horses come out. They all look pretty similar. You know, they're, the jockeys are all, you know, the same size and they're all pretty good. There's a lot of statistics you can see. But somehow the crowd has decided that number three is even money favorite, which is a 50 50 chance to win. And number six, who looks pretty good too, is like 70 to one. And they're mostly right. <laughs> so, you know, part of why I got into economics and psychology was thinking about episodes like that. How does the market put this information together? And are there mistakes? Like, how do you beat the market? So, so Fama turns out to be more or less right about the market. He was right about market. Timonium, Maryland. Right. And there were other interesting lessons too, like, so on the, if you go with like around the third race, you know, I was, I was a kid, so I was broke. Um, and my poor mom, my Irish mom was worried I was going to, you know, lose too much money. Um, I, I kept telling you, it's tuition, mom, it's tuition. <laughs> um, but you, if you go in the third race, there are these people who would sell tip sheets for like $5. Right. And it, you know. Because they know what's going to happen. They're selling the tip sheets, not making the bets. Exactly. The customer's yachts. Exactly. But if you go like in the, you know, the third or fourth um, race, they would quit selling them and they would just give them to you. Oh, like, really? Like, well, like a loss leader. Maybe you'll, <laughs> you'll, maybe next time you'll buy it. And so I'm sitting, you know, here's my little cynical 12, 13 year old brain thinking, why are you giving away for free tips that you claim can make me money? Like right. this does not, the math does not math. And um, I think that's a good lesson in, in life for markets, right? Yeah. Um, it's, but, you know, just, just to clear away like the most naive, you know, immunize yourself to the most naive schemes, you know. You, you would think if the tips were valuable rather than waste your time printing it up and selling them, you would just bet on the, exactly. on the why, winning yeah, horses, why these, right? Why? Especially in a parimutuel system, right? right. Because... Um, you know, the, the more the more your tip sheet buyers are betting on your horses, the, the lower less the you odds, can make. right? Exactly, it, it, right? It, they're betting it's against yourself. Counterproductive. Uh, our final so question. Good. Our final question. What do you know about the world of neuroeconomics today? Might have been helpful uh, when you were first getting started back in the 1980s. Um, I, you know, I'll answer that like a politician. I'll answer a, a question I have a better answer for, which is about <laughs> behavioral finance. Sure. So well, neuro- either or, uh, BFI or, or sure, neuroeconomics. Sure, right, yeah, got it. Um, so in neuroeconomics, I don't think I, we made too many mistakes. I think I wish we had, you know, we got a, a lot of grant support. Caltech was very supportive. I got to know a lot of interesting people who were generous with their time, who were kind of my tutors on neuroscience. I, I never took any formal you know, coursework on it. It was it came way, way, way after my mm-hmm. original grad training. So thank you, everyone. Um, I wish we had, we, we have not had much impact in ec- academic economics, particularly. Mm-hmm. And I, that's something we're kind of working on. Maybe we can do better. Behavioral finance, I think, um, I started graduate school in the late 70s. In 1978, Mike Jensen published a very influential paper. Mm-hmm. It was an introduction to a special issue and one of the first sentences is the market efficiency hypothesis is one of the most well-established empirical regularities in economics. But, and the, 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 but that was like the high water mark. Right. And the special issue was about there's some things that are anomalous, like earnings drift. Right. You, know, you get a weird earnings announcement. The market reacts, but then the market reaction drifts up for it takes a couple weeks, almost like food for the market to so absorb. It should not take a couple of weeks, right. right? There were other things where we see, you know, like one within one hour, markets are repricing mm-hmm. really well. But despite this Jensen article, the um, hostility to behavioral finance was ferocious. 
For ro- that's a big word. At it that was, time. It was that, so late 70s, early 80s. Late 70s, early 80s. And so that's when I was kind of deciding, do I want to stay in finance or mix it with it? And I remember having a discussion, I don't know if Gene remembers it the same way, with, I had to write a paper for Eugene Fama's course, who was also mm. kind of a mentor in the sense sure. that I, even though I didn't end up doing work that was close, you know, he, he was he was really relentless and very empirically driven and he had a really good idea. When he started, people were, thought he was crazy. Right. Because there was all this stuff on, you know, there was even, he wrote some papers on dividends, like, well, the optimal dividend payment policy. And of course, Miller and him was like, why pay dividends at all? You just like take money from one pocket and put it in the other. Um, well, back in the early days of widows and orphan stocks, you people lived on their dividends. Yeah, exactly, because of the liquidity. Right. Like it's, it's like, you don't want to sell. You want to hold on to it. Right. And, just, and then the just, dividends is, you know, is enough to live on. Yeah, now, yeah. now the theory has shifted towards uh, it's more efficient return of capital to shareholders doing buy box than dividends. But that's only total return. If you're looking for that income stream, buybacks don't necessarily help you. Right, right, exactly. So that's and that's also where the behavioral economics comes in. With you know, why can't you just like create whatever income stream you want by borrowing and selling? Right, know? that's uh, right. And if you know, if you're really liquidity constrained or credit constrained, you can't. But for most people, that's uh, not a big deal. Anyway, so so if I had known behavioral finance would. It didn't take off quickly. So from 1978, which is Jensen, 1981, I graduated. 1985 was the Thaler and DeBont paper mm-hmm. about um, January effects. Mm-hmm. And even that was published as a, um, it was in the proceedings issue, which meant that the president of the of the AFA could pan pick papers. So the proceedings issue had the most radical papers that were the foundation of behavioral economics. Mm-hmm. Um, Fisher Black wrote a paper called um, Noise Traders. In fact, it might have just been called Noise. Mm-hmm. And then Dick Roll wrote a paper called R Squared. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, if only news moves the market, right, then the R Squared on days with no news, you know, you shouldn't have any volatility. And of course, days with big news and small news, similar to the story uh, um, you were telling in the beginning, Days with big new, big obvious news and hardly any news move about the same. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, the assumption being, by the time it's in the front page of the New York Times, it's already reflected it's not moving in the, the markets, right. right? But it's, also, the, there may be things that are not newsy at all, like in the October uh, eighty-seven crash. Uh-huh. You know, the Bundesbank moved rates by a quarter of a point or something. Right? Who cares? That was the big news. Uh, but right, that. Um, but you know, you never know when that last straw breaks the camel's correct, back. Correct. Correct. But but so all those ideas now. Now that that we we you know we feel like we have an understanding and examples, th- there was a lot of hostility to that. So I the I remember asking Gene, um, I'd like to study market psychology. Like, what do you know about market psychology? And he said, What's that? <laughs> market, market psychology. <laughs> this Boston accent. You know, he's I I, I I think it's just a word they use on the news, like in Bloomberg. It's just a word they use on the news when the market moves and they don't know why. <laughs> right. Well, no one wants to admit it's you know? fairly random day to day. Yeah. We're very humans are very. I know that humans are very uncomfortable, and we're good at pattern sense making. Uh, right. We make up patterns. Fact. We come up with a narrative to explain it. Yeah. Um. I, I'm. I'm. I. I recall Dick Thaler quoting. Maybe it was Max Planck. Um, who was talking about physics? Science, science progresses one one funeral at a time. Thaler said the same thing about behavioral finance, and he also said, "I'm bypassing the current generation and going right to the kids, so they'll adapt oh, it yeah, wholesale." Yeah. And yeah. Um, literally, he said, uh, "I'm teaching grads and undergrads this, so we don't even have to wait for the funeral." And uh, it, it seems to have worked. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, Colin, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. This has been. Absolutely fascinating. I'm glad we finally managed to do this. We have been speaking with Professor Colin Kammerer of uh, California Institute of Technology. If you enjoy this conversation, well, check out any of the 500 previous interviews we've done over the past 10 and a half years. You can find those at iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Bloomberg, wherever you find your favorite podcast. And be sure and check out my new short-form podcast, At The Money, short, single-subject conversations with experts about issues that affect your money, earning, spending, and investing it. At The Money, in the Masters in Business podcast feed, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. 
I would be remiss if I did not thank the crack team that helps put these conversations together each week. John Wasserman is my audio engineer. Anna Luke is my producer. Sean Russo is my researcher. Sage Bauman is the head of podcasts at Bloomberg. I'm Barry Ritholtz. You've been listening to Masters in Business on Bloomberg Radio. Bloomberg Radio.